Hello and welcome to the Sheer Business Inspiration Podcast. Here you'll find conversations with business owners, leaders, thought leaders and inspiring individuals. We hope you enjoy. Welcome to episode three of the Sheer Business Inspiration Podcast. I'm Jo Faraday and in today's session I'm going to be speaking to Natalie K. Roche. Natalie is author of best-selling international book, Still Standing, and she's also a brilliant professional motivational speaker and TEDx speaker. She's a passionate anti-knife crime campaigner and a a great charity fundraiser. In 2016, heavily pregnant Natalie was the victim of a truly horrific life-changing attack. And in today's session, we'll talk more about her heinous ordeal four years ago. Natalie's comprehensively rebuilt her life, including starting up two businesses, raising her family, and also focusing on motivating and coaching in relation to anti-knife crime. Her story brings hope to all, and as well as empowering and inspiring her audience, Natalie always talks about living her best life and encourages other people to do the same. She offers an authentic guide on how to, how life can be pieced back together no matter what. And I'm sure you will agree this will be a really great episode. Thanks for joining us. Every year I say I meet people who raise my game, who inspire me, and our next speaker is no exception. Can I introduce you now to the wonderful, the incredible, Natalie K. Roche. Good morning. One in 144. One in 144 of us will at some point in our lives experience a life-changing event. And when I say life-changing, we're talking about something that metaphorically absolutely blows up our world. Whether you give in. Hi, and welcome to episode three of the Sheer Business Inspiration Podcast. Today, I am really pleased to be joined by Natalie Kiroche, and she is the keynote speaker, best selling author, and TEDx speaker and founder of I2QB, CIC, and Natalie Q Inspire. For those who may not be aware of you, Natalie, and your story, can you give us an overview? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, thanks for having me on. And uh, lovely to see you, Jo. Um, so really, my life changed from being really ordinary. Um, about four and a half years ago, I'd been in the pharmaceutical industry about 16 years, done various jobs within that and sales and training and management training. And I was eight months pregnant in... February 2016 and just about to go on maternity leave so I took a week's annual leave and then at the very beginning of March at the end of that week's annual leave I was heading in Sutton Coldfield town centre which is where I live for people who don't know Sutton Coldfield's like a nice suburb and it is true there are nice suburbs of Birmingham I promise you <laughs> and um, <laughs> I know people I've, I've lived in Sutton Coldfield it's a, lo- a very lovely place definitely <laughs> very nice, as you can tell from my accent but um, so um, it was an ordinary Friday afternoon, um, nothing sort of out there and I was heading into the town centre, I was walking down, eight months pregnant and as I walked into the town centre I was jumped from behind and um, I was literally touching distance from the town centre and the person who jumped on me, I thought I was being mugged and that I was trying to give up my handbag but they then proceeded to stab me, they produced a 12 inch kitchen carving knife and 
I was in complete utter disbelief, uh, as you would be, because you just think this isn't my world, this isn't my life, what the heck's happening? Um, the attack lasted nine minutes, and in those nine minutes, um, people did try to help and intervene. At one point, I broke free, and I managed to escape the attacker, but he came after me because I collapsed, and um, I was stabbed 24 times oh within God. that. Um, the injuries on their own 24 stab wounds obviously are going to be critical, but the knife had actually hit the outer part of my heart, my lung, it hit my diaphragm, my liver, the uterus carrying my baby, got through the main artery in my wrist. So I wasn't expected to survive. Um, the police were on the scene very quickly. They happened to be on foot patrol in the town centre. Totally bizarre coincidence. They're never around on foot patrol. They'd heard the screams for help and they arrested the attacker and then started working on me. Um, their their, their uh, first aid was second to none, you know, it was just amazing. An ambulance came, paramedics were fantastic, and an air ambulance, Midlands Air Ambulance, came and airlifted me to the QE hospital in Birmingham. Now, when they landed at the hospital, um, they reckoned I had less than five minutes left to live. I uh, wasn't actually expected to survive the flight, and it's the fact that if I'd gone on a road ambulance, if I'd been in a land ambulance, the helicopter hadn't been an option, I would have died in the back of that land ambulance that day. So um, I was rushed to surgery five hours and um, my baby was delivered during that time. She had to be resuscitated, she wasn't breathing. And um, she was put into a coma, I was put into a coma. And both of us fought back, both of us are here. She is now four and a half, about to be five. She's beautiful, she's funny. Um, yeah, she had effects from the attack, but my God, she hasn't let that stop her. Um, but the huge blow as well when I came around was the police telling me that the person who'd attacked me was actually my partner, who oh, uh, was part of my child, um, all in disguise. And I'd actually been talking to him on the phone as I made my way into the town centre. So there had been no warning. People go, you must have seen it. It must have been signs. No, this was a man mm -hmm. I'd known since we were 15, um, been friends for what seemed a lifetime got together in our later years, it was his first child, we lived together, everything seemed to be happy and we were a normal, I would say just a normal middle class couple living in a nice area with good jobs and there's nothing to say that this could possibly happen. So my life went from happy bubble to blown up within hours. Goodness so, Yeah, so it's a real period of, of realisation, a time of reflection that actually I could have died and it made me evaluate life very differently. So hence I went on to obviously rebuild life. I was in a very dark place, as you can imagine, emotionally, physically, very, very injured in both it's of such them. a traumatic experience. I mean, yeah. goodness me. And, and for your baby as well, like you say, you know, um, even though she was a baby at the time, it's the, the trauma, isn't it, that, you know? Yeah, and she has to know the truth at some point. And yeah. this is the thing, this will live with me for the rest of my life. I live with physical injuries anyway, long term. I've got a very damaged hand, so people can see I've got a very damaged left hand yeah. uh, and I can't feel half my hand. And I've got a lot of scar tissue in my chest still. Um, but my child, you know, she's got to learn the truth one day about what happened the day she was born and who did it. And she knows parts of the story, but that will affect anybody. Okay. You know, it can't not affect somebody and no. there's no getting away from being able to tell her because Obviously, it was all reported on. It hit national headlines. So it was all over the media, and it's, it's got a, a digital footprint. So yeah. she will always have to find out. Yeah. So that's me, really. And as you say, re re restarted and work a lot now in knife crime. That's my inspired quick blade. Yeah, that was, I was going to say, I know, I know that you, you know, you are an inspiration to many people. You know, you do want to give back you do want to support you know areas that that you know need that um so you know in terms of what you want to give back to society i mean it's great that you want to give you know you're that sort of person i know you you know you do want to give but what what do you want to give back to society what what's important to you i think the biggest thing that's important to me is um after my attack even during my attack do you know what people 
was selfless. Um, there were four members of the public that jumped in to help me as a stranger, you know. Yeah, um, that's lovely to hear that though, isn't it? Because, you, you know, in, in those times of need that there are people that, that will be there for you, you know. Well, there's one man who was walking down the hill behind the attacker and he said all he saw was this guy with his hood up, who's heavily disguised. He saw this knife coming down, he heard me scream and he threw himself on top of the attacker. Now, for somebody to do that, knowing that this person had a knife, it's so incredible and so selfless. And I had so much support after my attack. You know, I've had wonderful support through my family. I'm very lucky, great family. And, wonderful. and I've met such wonderful people. You know, you and I have met through all of this because of our contacts. And I've been so many people are always there to say, what can we do? What can we help? How can we support? And I just want to contribute that back to society. It's like feeding it back, you know, this whole giving forward sort of that you know sort of just trying to be that part and that person who can help support empower people especially people who have had tough times and a lot of us have had tough times in the moment as we're just coming through this covid period yeah it's horrific mental health everything else it's so challenging financially horrific people's worlds are changing and my part of what i want to play in society is to support other people now and try and just do my piece to make the world a little bit better and that and you know that's an amazing thing to to do considering you know that the situation that you found yourself in and like you said the rehabilitation of it all um i think it's such a strong and powerful message to, to a lot of people what what message would you give to young people you know who may feel compelled to carry a knife and potentially be involved in violent crime what what message would you want to give them right now yeah, well, I mean, it's such a pertinent question at the moment. Um, youth violence is actually on the increase. Um, we're seeing it as we come out of COVID lockdown. Um, obviously, young people have now been shut in away from the school environment for the best part of five months. It's such um, a long time, isn't it? It really yeah. is. And you've got to think, for, some vulnerable, well, for a lot of vulnerable young people, school is actually their only safe place. They might not like it, but it's somewhere where people are looking at them, they're caring, they're protecting them, they're getting fed. Yeah. Um, and what's happening is, is young people have had more time to be isolated, more time to be on social media, might be breaking out, hanging out in parks, and then they're more vulnerable to gangs, they're more vulnerable to wanting this sense of belonging with someone else because they haven't got it elsewhere. And so the risk of carrying a knife and getting caught up in these violence is huge. And all I want these young people, and what I talk about, and what I will be talking about with these young people as I go into sessions with them, is about, regardless of your environment, regardless of how negative things are around you, um, you have the strength inside of you to make a positive decision, to make a positive choice. And you don't deserve to live a life of fear of carrying a knife, because if you carry a knife, you're perpetuating the cycle. Yeah. And what you need to do is believe in yourself and believe that you can have a better life and you don't need to resign yourself to this negative world. And mm -hmm. what we need to do is empower our young people to see the power and strength they've got inside and the resilience they've got inside of them, yeah. that they don't need to resort to carrying a knife and they don't need to be increasing this horrific epidemic that we're seeing in knife crime. Yeah. And, and you know, like you say, there's it's so difficult isn't it you know I mean I, I come from you know a, a working class family um, personally and you know you, you you feel grateful for that that upbringing and that that thought process and I, I can't imagine being in a, in a family unit or, or situation where you actually don't feel that safe at home like you say the school you know for, for everything that, that you, they may say that it is actually is a you know a safe space for yeah. them so um, I, yeah. I, I feel like with kids who um are like in pupil referral units kids who've been permanently excluded and so this you know they would admit that but then you listen to the lives that they've led you listen to the things that they've witnessed you listen to either neglect or abuse that they've seen i've had young people who've told me how, how they've witnessed their mum being dragged into a shower or something and beaten up by the boyfriend that you know never the age of eight yeah. well, you know these children are are processing traumas that they're not getting support for they're not getting mm -hmm. help and, and if we can just help them work through that and help them see a different way forward and change this mindset and make them feel that knife crime actually is for cowards and actually it's socially unacceptable then we can start trying to get a change in the world 
Absolutely. And, you know, the fact that you, you were there as a support and, and to, to conduct these talks, you know, is, is a fundamental part of that support, isn't it? So, um, you know, I, I congratulate you on doing that. And I think it's such a, it's such a great, great thing to do. I think um, the big surprise of this old bird is a victim of a stabbing, I'll be honest. You can see their shock when they say, well, actually, I'm a victim of a multiple stabbing. They're all like, oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, the look on the face. Oh my goodness! Oh. <laughs> but it, you know, it's it's good that you do it. So you know, that, that is brilliant. And um, do you think you would be where you are today if your horrific life experience hadn't happened? I know it's a bit of a multi a multi question that one. But yeah, um, do you know what? I think I would be one of these people who. Okay, something might have kicked me up the backside to make a change in my life. Because the fact is, the pharmaceutical industry is a fantastic industry. Roche, who were the company that I was working for up to the point of the attack, they have been incredible. They were amazing, genuinely amazing with their support after my attack. Yeah, um, but the role for me personally didn't fulfill me. And I think I knew that. I did know that even before the attack. Yeah. But I was never brave enough to make that change because... It's a well-paid job, it's secure, I've got a nice company car, I've got the health insurance. And there's all these things that a lot of us can have, you know, where we've built up in the end and you always feel locked into a career or a path because... It's safer, isn't it? It's the safer option, isn't it? Yeah, I know yeah. what you mean. And although I had these dreams of things I wanted to do, I always thought, but what if, what if that, what if that goes wrong? And, oh my gosh, would I be able to get back from that? So I actually didn't have that self-belief and weirdly... Despite the fact that the attack, especially because of who did it, destroyed my self-belief initially, yeah. and it did, you know, it was horrific, you know, you can imagine my self-worth was just absolutely down the toilet. I had an amazing psychologist, and it, one of the things we did work on was my self-worth, my self-belief, and I actually then realised that this person that I'd been, who had come across as uber confident, really like, you know, out there in her field doing the pharmaceutical world, and had it looking like I was all together, actually... I doubted myself massively and doubted my ability of being able to step out on my own. And I think it took the attack and the, maybe not even just the attack, but it took the recognize, recognizing the lack of self-belief and building that self-worth up for me to now go on and do it. So the attack gave that opportunity because it gave me the opportunity to be my psychologist. It's um, interesting, isn't it? That, that, yeah. that you, know, you hadn't realized and it took this huge trauma to almost be directed to the person that you wanted, you know, to be. Obviously, you don't, you, you would never have wanted that traumatic experience to happen. Nobody would want that. But equally, you've, you've been able to, to glean something from that situation. So, um, you know, that, that it, it's a good thing. It's not a good thing. <laughs> I wouldn't no, wish it on anyone, but it's that, yeah, it's that situation, is it? Where you I think that whole fact of, I had to face up that, in the end, accept that I'd survived, and yeah. that was incredible. I had to stand up against a lot of scrutiny, because, you know, there's people yeah. saying, well, surely she must have known, what were the signs, what, why did he do it, why did he do it? And it was all put down to this pressure from his mother, he didn't improve the relationship. It was all not the relationship, but he had, clearly he's had mental health issues and various yeah. things theories about why he did it but um he was very clever and nobody could see it and but I had to stand up to that scrutiny of people yeah. looking at things I mean I had a neighbor um my neighbor at the time <laughs> questioned me and I was carrying my little one home at the car and she stopped me oh how are you doing Natty how's the little one blah 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 and she looked at my little one and she looked at me and she went so is is she his and she oh goes, my god because everyone's been like obviously talking about why he did it so just wondering is the baby actually his and I was like what what and then I went into this justification mode and it's like oh my god you live next door to us as a couple as this family unit and, yeah, no. and you're asking me to my face I'm like this is not Jeremy Kyle or so I look around for a camera this is Jeremy Kyle do you want a DNA test and I think because I had to stand up to so much, I suddenly thought, hold on, I've got a lot more strengths than I gave yeah. myself credit for. Yeah. And this word that I always go back to, this resilience. Yeah. And, um, and I think all of us, when we reflect back on life, we can all find out periods of when we've got 
resilience and we yeah. don't give ourselves because all of us have been through tough times all of us in our lives can go back and go but that's the thing that. isn't it um, ups and downs you know peaks and troughs yeah. um yes the, the trauma that you've experienced is, you know is horrific and, and awful and you know that that's like going to be the most severest dip in your life I mean, equally <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but you you look at then what what you've evolved into and what what you're doing and there, there's massive peaks there and and fantastic successes so tell us about your best-selling book still standing um, i know it's been successful on a global scale and um, what's it about and where can readers find your book so um still standing a uh, it was born out of um, when I was in hospital, weirdly, still, and um, didn't ever think, oh, I'm going to write a book, I'll be totally honest, I was too busy trying to get from day to day. Piece it all together, yeah. Yeah, you know, kind of had a few other things to do, like police interviews and <laughs> live and rebuild life. But um, my my elder sister, who, um, she works for the BBC, but actually she's a trained counsellor as well. So with her counselling, she came in one day, very well-meaning, with this notebook and said to me, Natalie, I want you to write down how you're feeling, how your thoughts are. And um, now, during the attack, like I mentioned, my left hand was very badly damaged, and mm -hmm. I am left-handed, so I couldn't even write at the time. Oh, my goodness. So I looked at her, and I'll be totally honest, I told her where to stick her notebook. <laughs> <laughs> you can see the left hand doesn't work. I was like, seriously? Seriously? Really? Are you freaking joking me? What are you me? I was like, no. <laughs> And um, I sort of put it on the side. And she, she's, still, she's very calm. My sister's very calm and loving and peaceful. And she said, well, it's there. And as it was, I then started to try to write with my other hand and start to write. And I used to write a few little things I had to remember to do list of, oh, I need to phone this, or I need to do that. And weirdly, without thinking, I then started to write down as the weeks went on how I was feeling. Now, that then evolved that... I started to find out more and more things about my ex-partner, Bobby, who did this. And I started to note them down too, because they were it was astounding. He led such a double life, telling so many lies. And yes. So I started writing down all these things. Before I knew it, I was writing a journal of my entire journey, like how I felt, what I was finding out and things. And, and there's so many pieces in the media that were untrue or twists of the story and literally completely inaccurate accounts. So I thought, I want people to know what the truth is. And I want people to know what this journey is like. And so I started to actually write the book and never thought whether it would come to anything. I had it as a goal. I actually did set it as a goal. I'd like to write a book. Um, so I started writing it and so the Still Standing takes you through as a reader, my journey from when I met Bob again as an adult, so we'd always known each other. We had mutual friends. My best friend married from school was married to his best mate, that sort of thing. But we got together as a couple a year after my marriage had broken down. So we'd been married, had two children, divorced. So you go through this journey. You hear about all the other crazy things that happened at the same time when I was a single mum. And you just hear this love story developing. And then it takes you through the attack. And then it takes you through how it was afterwards. But the incredible thing is, is then you go on the journey afterwards where I start to discover all these things. So then you can reflect back and go, well, yeah, I remember writing about that happening. And then you learn the truth of what actually was happening that I didn't even know. So you live it as if you were me. And it takes you through right up to the point I faced him in prison. So a year after he was sentenced, I pushed, I pushed and pushed. I was determined. People go, why did you want to see him? I went, because he left home as normal that day. It's a, it's a closure thing as well, isn't it? Yeah. I, I'm with you. I think you want to face that person and yeah. understand, try and understand why they would do that. Yeah. Because also the reason, I mean, I, I said it right from hospital to firm, the police are interviewing, I went, I'll speak to him, they went, Nasty, you can't, it's a criminal investigation. Then as soon as we got sentencing, weirdly, we sentencing day, everyone do remember the day of sentencing, as far as it was the day we voted for Brexit, it was June the 23rd, um, 2016. So while everyone was at the polls, I was sitting in a room in courtroom all day, and, um, and I did go vote afterwards, to be fair, but um, that even didn't go the way that I wanted it either. But, uh, <laughs> um, there you go, political point. But I was determined, so I literally fought 
you know, and it took me a year. The prison didn't want me to go in. The prison, and this is what gets me mad sometimes. Um, the prison didn't want me to go in because they were worried about how it affects his mental health. So they didn't consider me as a victim of, well, actually, for my mental health, I need to face him. And I've got a psychologist who says I'm more than capable and balanced enough to go and face him. Yeah. So it was a long fight and I walked in there um, in June of 2017. I spent a whole day. So still standing as a book, you go through that day. Yeah. And I wrote a lot of notes when I came out of prison that day, so I'd remember it all. So you actually hear about all the conversation that took place, all that he said and I said. And, um, and then there's a bit of piece about sort of like a summary of what I've done since. But it's hopefully a book where people can see raw honesty and there'll be things in there that will surprise people. There'll be yeah. points that people go, oh, crikey, why is she feeling like that? But you've got to remember, it's, I'm just being honest in it. Yes, I'm yeah. Really honest. I'm not saying something to be popular sometimes. I was going to say, you just, it's, it's, it's an account of, of, of everything that happened in its entirety and that you, you're just fulfilling that it's for no you know no no other reason or agenda it's to get that out you know out there and hopefully support and help people that are in um, you know difficult situations I mean we, we've talked about the pandemic brief, briefly but I mean obviously it is it's turned a lot of, of lives upside down obviously there's been countless amounts of people that are no longer with us and it, it's completely tore through the whole world uh, you know it's a global pandemic and you know how we all w live breathe work play or not play as the case yeah. might be and um, you know it, it has affected a lot of people and I think you know that's one of the reasons I wanted you you to come on here because you've you've had such a traumatic experience and your mindset and your approach in the way that you 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 know do things you know i think it will really resonate with a lot of people and, and support them what does resilience mean to you though natalie what what does that word mean to you because you mentioned it a bit earlier but yeah resilience to me is about how we get through tough times you know it, it's about drawing that power from within in order to get through tough or difficult times and the thing is as i've mentioned before all of us will have done that um, you know, when I got divorced, um, I actually had a relatively amicable divorce. I still get on very well with my ex-husband. You know, we are still friends. It just we didn't work out as much. But it's still a tough time. Yeah. And when I look back at that, you know, I, was a sing I became a single mom of two children who were three and seven. I was working full time in the pharmaceutical industry, so I had to dig deep. So even something as often to say as mainstream as divorce, but unfortunately, it is quite. You know, there's a lot of us that have gone through that. You, we've all had to have times where we've had to be resilient, where we've had to dig deep, where something has challenged us. And to me, resilience is just having that ability to focus on the path ahead and forge on. And it's not easy. It doesn't mean you have to be happy, clappy, or it's going to be a linear recovery. My, my recovery wasn't linear. In fact, it still isn't. I still have times where I'll have a dip or a flashback, or I might question something that I'm doing. You know, I'm not, I mean, Wonder Woman. Um, you know, it's, it's just real. It's just about yeah. saying, I've just got to drive on. I've just got to put, even if you're just putting that one foot in front of the other. Yeah. You know, the beginning part for me of resilience was making that decision about the whole sink or swim and saying, no, I've got to get up. I've got to put my makeup on, do my hair so my kids yeah. recognise that this is mum. I've got to get up. I've got to get them to school. Yes. Um, now, if I get back from school and I sit and I give myself a time to cry, yeah. that doesn't make me weak because no. I'm still functioning and I'm still getting on. And I think sometimes we're too tough on ourselves. I think um, you're right, yeah. And, and it, you know, especially at the moment, you know, uh, they call it the corona coaster, don't they? You know, where you, you have up and down days. I know I have them, you know, and I'm and, and not the only one. I think it's, it's, you have to sometimes just embrace the feeling. And like you say, as long as you pick yourself up, back up and don't, make yourself go down in that that deep darkness then you know that that is is a thing that you need to allow yourself to be what but my question of you is what motivates you what makes you you know you, you want to give to others you know what what motivates you as a person the thing that's always motivated me um and it might sound cheese um is is my kids i'll yeah. be totally honest it's my three children i've got 
three daughters. They are fantastic. They're amazing. I have a teenager through to obviously a four and a half year old who's back to start school. <laughs> Hopefully start school if Gavin Williams can actually go. <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> I can't hope to anymore. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm two weeks to go. go. So yeah, two more weeks. <laughs> it won't be water in my water bottle if we don't get back to school soon. Um, but um, but no, um, it is my children. Um, they're the ones who got me to be back on my feet. I, I mean, I still question: Would I have recovered like I did if I hadn't have got the purpose that I had to give them the best that I could? Yeah. And really, you know, working you know, working hard and focusing on my children, that almost gave me my inspiration to do my community interest company, you know, about doing that because seeing like working with the trauma and how it affected my children sort of made me realise there's a lot of young people out there that we shouldn't just judge them based on their actions. Yeah. Um, you know, there can be all sorts of reasons behind that and trying to make a better world. The world, I think, for young people is extremely tough. Yeah. I think. There's always loads of challenges without knife crime. Knife crime just adds a whole different... I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't any social media when I was growing up, so that's yeah. another layer of, you know... It is, and social media, it's got so many positive points, but at the same time, I think it's caused a lot of damage, and it does still cause a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. And that's what motivates me, is to try and help develop a supportive society, because I think my kids coming through all of that that they, they need that world they yeah. need that world and yeah. it's something that potentially has got a bit neglected in our fast living life that i you know i'm not sure sometimes children's needs their real integral needs are always accounted for yeah and, and I, I agree with that wholeheartedly 100 percent Right, Natalie, so just tell us all about your challenge that you've completed recently for Midlands Air Ambulance. I've been following it, but, I, but I'd love everyone else to hear about it. So please do share what you've been up to with that. Well, it's kind of like a continu continuity, sort of, of a, a continuation of lots of crazy challenges that I do for Midlands Air Ambulance Charity. And have done really in the last four years since they um, airlifted me back in 2016. Uh, this time it was a challenge that really meant a lot to me on many different levels. Um, it's something I've talked about for some time and because of COVID, so many events and charity events had to be cancelled and it's trying to think of something that could still be done with social distancing adhered to if it was needed. So what I did was I walked with my now partner, um, Simon, and we walked from RAF Cosford in Shropshire, which is just near Telford, yeah. to Sutton Carford Town Centre. Oh, wow, um, that was a distance in itself. <laughs> that was a long distance, to be fair. <laughs> we started at 4 a.m., so yeah. it really felt like a long distance. Yeah. It was nice and dark. We had to have head torches because it's really rural. I was going to say it's Shropshire. really rural around there, yeah. <laughs> and um, we. We got to Stone Coffer Town Centre to the point where I was airlifted from, got there just before lunchtime, spent about an hour there because there's various interviews to be done. Yeah. And then we carried on to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham, which is, for those who don't know, Southern Coffer is like North Birmingham and the QE sits on South Birmingham side. Yeah. So it's quite a trek. It's a, a real trek, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the purpose of it was, was um, the helicopter... Midlands Air Ambulance have three helicopters and the helicopter that airlifted me came out of RAF Cosford that day. Wow. So it's trying to reenact walking the route that the helicopter took. Um, obviously, I took a hell of a lot longer than the helicopter, thank God. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I'd be dead. <laughs> so, um, but they, um, it was trying to sort of follow the route and we purposely did it. We started so early in the morning because we wanted to make sure we finished by four in the afternoon, yeah. which was the time that I landed at the QE and it was a Friday. So it was really, really poignant. Um, we had masses of support. We raised about £4,300. Yeah. Especially in current COVID times. That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And we'd had corporate sponsorship. Um, I hope you don't mind if I, you know, I had... Um, guys from GMS, Bootcamp Media, Reactive Recruitment, you know, companies, you know, they're not like massive corporations, but these are companies that just got a heart, and this is the whole piece. Yeah. You know, I know you do a load of engagement charity, you know, we've seen each other many times at charity yeah. events, and, and it's so important to have that 
connection and to be able to pay things forwards with your actions and um and it's just lovely to have that and the grace church shopping center and also supported us and um it's a fantastic event and great because it didn't matter that social distancing was a thing because it was me and my other half so yeah and also quite poignant for you like you say you know that the it's almost you know like you say you you you've been to the site where it happened many times but i guess for you it that oh, was really an emotive day wasn't it yeah this is the thing it hit me a lot harder i think than i expected because i have been there loads of times you know yeah. it, it's the local shopping center but um being there on that day my two elder daughters were there waiting for me in certain conference time center with my sister and I think as I rounded that corner and could see the landing site and my children were stood there and clapping away. And the fact is, is that it reminded me that if, if I hadn't been for the air ambulance, I would have died in the back of a land ambulance. I wouldn't have made it to the hospital because I was so touch and go. Yeah. And my kids wouldn't have had their mum. Yeah. And it's as black and white as that. You know, my children yeah. wouldn't have had their mum. And to see my kids there at that point and they're celebrating that we're doing this and they, they love everything to do with the whole charity side of it yeah. and, their and, um, and I was also doing it to the QE hospital this time as well so it's yeah. a combined thing um, and it was it was really emotional I, I was actually quite choked up when we were yeah. like I'm not surprised, like you're saying, and having your daughters there and things like you say, you know, it's a point, poignant but it, but it was you know, you did such a great thing for those charities, and you know, fantastic that you you could do it. You're you know the half. That's that's brilliant. And well, if you follow the video towards you. the end, you'll have seen me limping because I think we hit. Yeah. I got to about bring your place, and I was like, we're nearly there. It's two miles to the QE. Yay! We just gotta go down the canal towpath, and so it just went in my heel oh, and no. like sharp pain. And you know, and you just think, no. Even if I crawl up this towpath, I am getting the Yeah, I am getting there, yeah, yeah. No, knowing you, yes, you, you, you absolutely, that, that, that finish line, there was no way you weren't getting there, so that, yeah. that's it. Drag myself across. <laughs> Bless you, but congratulations for doing that and for raising such a great sum of money. Um, you know, just it just say, it says to people, you know, that in these times, you know, we can all pull together and we can all do things, great things. If you could give listeners one inspiring positive message right now, what would what would you what would you say? I think the real key thing to remember at the moment and it's such a tough period for so many of us um whatever business you're in whatever your life is whether you know you're just managing your family at home um it's so tough and at times it feels like it's never ending and i know that after my attack at times the dark periods the tough times i just didn't see a way out but we need to hang on that there is always a way out and no matter how horrific things might seem you've just got to hang on in there set yourself your little goals you might have to change your plans but think you know what this change is happening for a reason yeah and there is a positive way boys and my attack was horrific yeah. and it was horrific but i've had so many amazing things happen since then and maybe it's all just part of some bigger plan i don't know but um we we can always adapt to change and it is always possible to come back from the worst of times yeah absolutely and that, you know there's no one better to deliver that message than you absolutely so what's next for you tell, tell us what what you're up to what what you what are your plans what's next there's always something that's there's next. always something there that is actually <laughs> something there. Um, there's always other charity events that i'm planning which i am uh midlands air ambulance on their 30th anniversary next year so uh, there's always discussions about some stupid extreme challenge that I'm <laughs> what will we get you to do next <laughs> yeah, and i'm always like yeah i'll do that i'll do that and then i get close to your bed i'm like what the <laughs> hell <have I> done? <laughs> um so um i'm doing a lot more motivational speaking obviously Brilliant. getting used to this online presence that we're all having to adapt yeah. to um learning to present sort of I, I do it on my feet still even though we're on camera um i mean i'm still doing an intro so a little shameless plug here um, yeah, it's still fine. Yeah, um, absolutely. Still very much 
pushing that so my crop yes absolutely so you should um, that's on and amazon and it's in all bookstores as well isn't yeah, it yeah so. it's in bookstores it's even appeared in supermarkets and my mum very excitedly phoned me from the works and so brilliant it's in the works look and it's on the charts bless her <laughs> And it's even gone. I mean, I'm quite proud. This is the um, Estonian version. So it's in six countries across the world now. Um, Brilliant. Like Australia and New Zealand and Singapore. Amazing. Um, and had its translation into um, Estonian. And so it's quite strange. Sort of, I sit there trying to sort of work out what it is. Babe, my Which know. words are what? And yeah. <laughs> like, right, again, right. recognise my name and that's about it. But um, yeah. so there's a lot of work with that. Um, in terms of my overall passion with youth work, I'm trying to expand now uh, what I can do to support young people and understand their world. Because I think right. to make a change and help drive a change, you yeah. really understand. So I'm just about to do a course, which will be alongside all my work, it will be in the evenings, where I'm doing about gangs and youth violence. Um, so it's, com it's all about building up on how I can support young people as best I can amazing and that's such such a needed thing it's such a needed thing and the fact that you're immersing yourself in that alongside everything else and raising a family you know you know just totally in awe and you know inspired by everything that you do so just thanks for being a great guest and i could talk to you for hours and hours but you know <laughs> i know i know you, you've got everything to be doing <laughs> <laughs> yeah so thanks again for being great and um, still standing as um, Natalie's mentioned is on Amazon and in all um, the bookstores but we will share the links if you want to book it online and um, yeah we'll put we'll share all your social handles and things if people are wanting to follow you and, and follow your, your journey and your story now so yeah and um, thanks again and um, we'll have you on again soon I'm sure yeah. talking about your next challenge and uh, Great to have you on, Natalie. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much Natalie K. Roche for joining us for episode three. I could talk to you for hours and I know that there will be many people that will really have drawn a lot of inspiration and motivation from you sharing such a personal and harrowing story but also giving people the hope and the vision that things don't always stay in, in a bad place. There are ways to work through it. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. And we'll have you on again soon and um, you can tell us more about what you're up to next. So for those of you looking to, to find out more, please follow us on all of our social media areas, so Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, um, and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, we we'll, would love to hear more um, about what you'd like to hear and also your thoughts and um, opinions on you know, what, what great content you'd like to hear more of. Um, but for now, we're really excited to be sharing all of this with you, so thank you. For episode four, we're really excited to be speaking to Dean Seddon. Now, Dean is the founder of Maverick, um, which is a marketing and growth training and consultancy company. And they work with small to medium sized enterprises. And um, Dean and his team have been training and supporting clients um, for a number of years now. Um, and they are on a mission to help over a million businesses in terms of growth. And I'm not going to give too much away, but they've been working tirelessly through this lockdown period and have had some brilliant successes. So please do tune in to find out more. Um, a little bit about Dean, he is a Forbes contributor and he has a real no-nonsense communication style. So that does allow him to quickly guide people to the solutions and to achieve the goals um, that they're eager to achieve. Um, and Dean's Maverick style has enabled him to be drafted into a range of crazy projects. So he'll tell us more about that in the episode. Do tune in and um, we hope that you enjoy it as much as we do. Thanks for listening.